Good morning, everybody. Good morning. If we have not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Kenson. I serve as one of the pastors at Park Community Church, uh, specifically our Bridgeport location, which is right down the street. Um, always a joy to be with you all. Thank you also for just accommodating and moving your worship service hour so that I can be here and to join you. Um, and I also want to apologize because every time I'm here, I want to stay, but I have to run off again to another Sunday school class back at my church that's happening like right now. So um, yeah, but I hope to spend some more time with you guys uh, in the weeks and months to come. So once again, we are in Luke chapter 10. You know, as a family of six, so I have my wife and five other boys, myself included, our fridge is always packed with food. Now, having so much food in the fridge, it can be easy to lose track of expiration dates, that food gets stuffed all the way to the back of the fridge, so out of sight, out of mind. And there are many occasions we find out too late and the food goes bad. You know, recently I ate a one-week-old birthday cake, which was a bad idea. Don't do it. Um, now, there are some occasions when we find food and we catch it just in time. There's a day or two right before it expires, and when that happens, it is all hands on deck. Recently, my wife found some pork that was going to expire, so we were eating pork in our house for days. Pork in our sandwiches, pork in our omelets, pork in our stew, pork in fried rice, pork in our salads, pork for church potluck. Susan was determined not to let the pork go to waste. Knowing that she only had a limited amount of time made her urgent. You know, today Jesus extends a similar situation to us. He says in verse 2, And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, to understand what Jesus is saying here, we city folk need to understand just how time-sensitive the harvest season was. Because to wait could mean losing all your crops losing it to weather, losing it to animals, you know, ha having it go bad so that you can't sell it or you can't eat it. You know, failing to be ready for the harvest season would be disastrous for a family, for a community. Now notice that Jesus says here to pray earnestly. This is the only time when Jesus tells us to pray and puts that word earnest next to it. So we need to pay attention. Now to pray earnestly means to pray with conviction, to pray with determination, why? Because of the size, because of the plenty of the harvest, and time is running out. So imagine a farmer is standing in the middle of, in the middle of a field where there are rolling hills of wheat as far as the eye can see, and the harvest is ripe and ready. It's, it's overwhelming. Uh, some of you have made the drive down to Springfield or to Champaign-Urbana southern Illinois, and when you go down that road, there is cornfields upon cornfields upon cornfields. Just imagine standing in the middle of all of that and hearing it's ready to be harvested. It's overwhelming, right? It's overwhelming. You're all by yourself. The task is too great. Even if you were to work on, on it nonstop, 24 hours, seven days a week, you had a tractor, you couldn't make a dent because the harvest is so great. Jesus is giving us a metaphor here so that we can feel this urgency. When Jesus talks about a harvest, he's talking about the incredible spiritual need that is around us. People who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And when he talks about laborers, he's talking about us. Verse 1, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him. Now, a key word here is the word others. This tells us that the circle of those who are part of Jesus' mission is expanding. That first, Jesus came to earth on mission. Then after that, he had his 12 disciples with him on mission. Now we read in our verses that there are 72 disciples that are now on mission. Then we find out in the resurrection that there are 500 disciples with him. Then we find out at Pentecost that there are 3,000 disciples at that time. The ministry of Jesus is no longer connected to a few people, but to all of us. Jesus is calling all of us to go into the harvest. 
He's calling all of us to meet the spiritual need of those around us. And there is just so much work to do because a harvest is plentiful. People are needy and ready to hear the good news of Jesus. But so often, we are not ready for this work. Because we're so wrapped up in our lives, with all the drama that's happening in our families, in our workplaces, in our own hearts. And frankly, thinking about the harvest, thinking about people's readiness to listen to Jesus, isn't on the top of our minds. Instead, we're occupied with worldly concerns, you know, paying the bills, eating out, what to wear, you know, you know, finishing the exam, you know, stuff like that. Now, these things are important, and they are part of the rhythms of life. But Jesus is saying, there is so much more for us to see. When he says that the harvest is plentiful, it is meant to awaken us. It is meant to open our eyes that the people that are living and working and studying around us every day, who are open and responsive to the Lord, they are if we would just notice them. You know, friends, are you aware that people are ready to hear about Jesus? You know, you, know, last Friday, you know, last Friday, I was in an open gym playing some volleyball. And normally, I don't socialize too much because volleyball is war. You know, Linda knows this, okay? Uh, but on this Friday, you know, random Friday, you know, as I was waiting to kind of play the next game, I noticed that there was someone sitting by themselves. And I usually, you know, don't talk with this person. But the Holy Spirit prompted me. So I sat down and, and we started talking. And he was telling me that he was looking for a new job and it's been a big struggle for him. So I just told him, like, hey, you know, I'm going to pray for you about this. And when I said that, his eyes were just like, what? Like, you're going to pray for me? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pray for you. And the next thing you know, we're talking about faith. We're talking about religion. We're talking about my Christian faith. We're talking about his Hindu faith. We're talking about all these things. The harvest is plentiful. Jesus is giving us a wake-up call. He's inviting us to join him in his work. He wants us to shake off the things of this world so that we can be about the things of the kingdom. So with that, let's go and look at our verses here. And what I want to do is I want to be able to show you how Jesus helps his disciples get ready for the harvest so that we can get ready. And here are the three points uh, to move us along. First, Jesus gives us instructions on how to harvest. Second, Jesus tells us that not everyone is going to receive the message. And then finally, Jesus tells us to head into this harvest with joy. Do it with joy. So here's the first point. Jesus gives instructions to his disciples on how to head into the harvest. And let's break this down verse by verse. And this first point will be longer than the other two points here. So the first point is this. He gives instructions. So look at verse 1 here. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, in every town and place where he himself was about to go. So the first instruction we see here is that Jesus tells them to go to the harvest and to do it with others. He sends them out two by two, and it's a reminder that ministry is best done with others. And frankly, you know, when it comes to things for God, it can feel risky at times, but it's less scary when you do it with others. You know, just two weeks ago, my son turned 15. Uh, and the next big step, you know, after he turned 15, I said, you got to get ready because in a few months, you're going to be taking driver's ed. And he said, oh, I don't want to do it. You know, driving is so intimidating. You know, it's just, uh, they're all crazy. And, and, I, and I said this to him, you'll be okay. We'll practice together so that you'll be ready for driver's ed. And then he said, okay, that's fine. You, do you see? The challenge of driver's ed was still there, but it was less scary because he had me. Sharing Jesus, let's be honest, it can be scary at times, but we can give courage to one another. We can give wisdom so we can discern how the Spirit is leading. We can protect one another from accusations and temptations and distractions. We together can answer questions together. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says this. It says, two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. 
You know, invite other believers to join you in reaching others. Ha have them pray with you. Invite those who don't know Jesus to, to come to, the Bi to Bible study or to come to Sundays and let the church family welcome them in. You know, let, the, let them help with the work too. Don't work the harvest alone. You don't have to. Here's the second instruction that Jesus gives. He tells them to pray. In verse 2, he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Why pray? Because God is the Lord of the harvest. He's the one in control. He's the one who brings the fruit. Once again, the harvest is too great. We can't keep up with it, but God can. We can't do anything to save the eternity of souls. God can. We can't transform hearts to spiritual life. God can. You know, in Luke chapter 18, there's a story of a rich young ruler, a guy who has it all. And when, Jesus, when he goes to Jesus saying that, hey, you know, how, how do I have eternal life? Jesus says, you know what? Give up everything you have and follow me. And the guy's like, I won't do it. The disciples are just so discouraged because they look at this younger, rich young ruler and they're like, this guy has it all. He has wealth, right? So clearly God's blessed him. He, he says that he's been following the law perfectly. So if a guy like this can't get into heaven, who can get into heaven? Jesus answers, what is impossible with men is possible with God. The harvest is impossible for us, but nothing is impossible for God. This should give us incredible encouragement to share Jesus with others because I'm not the ultimate factor in someone's salvation. Thank goodness I'm not the ultimate factor. But God is. God opens hearts. God opens eyes. All we have to do is trust him and to let us use us. Praying, spiritually, praying for the spiritually lost in our lives should be a daily rhythm for us every day. Next, Jesus instructs his disciples to be lambs, to be lambs. Verse 3, go on your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Now, if Jesus is trying to get his disciples excited for this mission, it's doing the opposite here, if, if you ask me. Because last I remember, wolves eat sheep, they hurt sheep, uh, they tear them to shreds. So Jesus, if this is what it means to go to the harvest, uh, no thanks. I don't think I'm interested. Now Jesus here, to a degree, is being transparent about the challenges of following Jesus, that the world hates the truth of God. They hate that God tells them what to do. They hate the cross because the cross says to the world, you are wrong. You must repent. That is not a popular message. And we'll talk about this in our second point. Not the, the world's not always going to receive those who give the message of Christ. So the harvest will be hard. But in addition, when Jesus tells us to be lambs, he's also telling his disciples, he's telling us the posture in how we are to go about into the world. To go as lambs and not wolves. Don't go out there growling and savage and vicious but go as lambs. Go completely dependent on God for your protection. Remember, how did Jesus come into the world? He came as a lamb amongst wolves. He came in sacrifice. He came in love. He came in service. Jesus is calling us to go into the harvest in a meek and gentle way. Next, Jesus instructs them in verses 4 and 9 to go undistracted, to go undistracted. Uh, verses 4 and 9 again. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon them. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and, and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So Jesus here is teaching us, teaching his disciples to be utterly dependent on him. First, he tells them, don't bring anything extra with you. Don't be distracted with, you know, about money or your sandals breaking. Trust me to provide for these necessities. You know, as Hudson Taylor, a missionary, once said, 
He said God's work in God's way will never lack God's supply. Trust God to provide for your necessities, for this mission. In addition, Jesus says, greet no one on the road. Now, what's up with that? Because that seems kind of rude not to greet someone on the road. What Jesus is saying here is that he's reminding his disciples to keep their eyes on the harvest. Keep this in mind, that back in ancient times, and even today in Eastern cultures, a greet can be very lengthy. That people back then didn't have social media or emails or phones to stay in touch. So if you greeted somebody, it was extended. It was a long hug. You would have a meal. You should have a meal because, you know, that's hospitality. You would sit down for hours. Greetings in the Middle East could keep a person from going where they needed to go. Jesus here is not telling us to be rude. He is just highlighting again the urgency of the task. Time is limited, so don't be distracted. Don't be distracted about your necessities, your worldly concerns. Don't be distracted about greetings on the road. Jesus continues on, and, 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 he, and he says here that if you find a home that welcomes you, stay there. Don't move. Now, why does Jesus say this as an instruction? It's because there was a real temptation for the disciple to look for a better deal. Uh, let me just paint it out for you. So imagine that you're, a, you're, you're the two disciples, you come into a brand new town, and there's a family that welcomes you in. And it's a very humble home, it's a, it's a smaller home, you know, and, and you're grateful for it. That first week you're like, I'm so grateful that, that I have a place to stay. But a week into the missions trip, you find out that someone else in the town, they have a pretty nice house. It's bigger, the food's better, it's more comfortable, they got a big screen TV, there's air conditioning, there's a fruit platter every morning, and the home that you're staying in, it's small, it's cramped, they don't have AC, you're sleeping on the floor, you're sleeping with the rest of the family, everyone's snoring, you know, ah, it's driving you crazy. Jesus says, don't move. You find that better house, don't move. Why? It's because to be a disciple of Christ is not about seeking luxury. It's about seeking the harvest. Don't go looking to increase your convenience or comfort. Don't be distracted by the pleasures of the world. Keep the main thing the main thing and trust God to provide. This is why Jesus tells them not to bring extra stuff because God is your extra stuff. God is your provider. In addition, it can be a really poor testimony of Christ to hop from house to house seeking to increase your luxury to, to, to keep increasing the luxury in your life. A disciple of Jesus should be known about someone who's concerned, should not be known as somebody who's concerned about comfort more than they are about souls. A disciple should demonstrate an attitude of contentedness and gratefulness. Don't be distracted by worldly things. Trust God to provide. You know, two weeks ago on a Monday, someone broke into our garage and stole Evan, my oldest son's bike. Now, it was 7 a.m. on Monday morning, and I was in the middle of a church-wide elder call at home. And the next thing you know, uh, my 8-year-old son comes running up to me because I have my headphones in, so I don't really hear what's going on in the house. And my son runs up to me and says, Mommy says that someone is in our garage. I'm like, what? So I take out my phone, I open up my app, my garage app, I look at, my, I look at the camera, and guess what? There's someone in my garage. So I jump out of my chair, and the elders are probably wondering, like, well, what's, what's going on with Kenson here, like, on the Zoom call? Like, what, what's, what's going on here? I'm, like, running out of my house, heading to the garage, but it's too late. The guy has already taken my bike, and he's already down the block with my son's bike. Now, let me just say, this was not an expensive bike. The bike was close to 15 years old. The chains were rusted. The handlebar was all torn up. Frankly, the guy who stole my bike did me a favor in cleaning out my garage. So, uh, so... So monetary-wise, money-wise, it's not a big deal. It, it didn't cost me anything. But nonetheless, you know, like, you know, like there's, there's anger. There was fear. There was a bit of feeling violated. Like so someone actually broke into my garage. So after a little bit, I got back on the call, on the Zoom call with my elders, and I told them, hey, I'm sorry. I had to run off so abruptly. But just so you guys know, someone literally just broke into my garage and stole my bike. Now, the elders on the call, they were very sympathetic. And I actually appreciate what one of the elders said to me. He said, Kenson, this is the price we pay to love our city. This is the price we pay to love our city. 
You know, that really challenged me because I realized that I was distracted from the main thing. That the most important thing was not that the bike was stolen. The most important thing was the harvest. The most important thing was this man's soul. So that night, you know, I got all my youngest sons together. So keep this in mind that when this happened at 7 a.m., my kids were just heading out in their carpool to school. So as they're heading out to school, they're hearing that someone's broken into the garage, and I'm running out of the house. So we have not had a chance to reconcile the moment. So I bring my youngest sons together, and I told them, guys, the bike means nothing, but this person's soul means everything. So what we did right then and there, there is that I prayed for him. I prayed for this man's salvation, and I prayed that one day, that all together as a family, we would be worshiping Jesus together in heaven. Don't be distracted. Keep your eyes on the harvest. So first, Jesus gives us his instructions. Here's the second point that Jesus gives us. Jesus gets his disciples ready by telling them that not everyone is going to accept you and your message. Now, the verses here are going to get pretty spicy, okay? Uh, verse 10 to 16. Jesus says, But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its street and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to, your, to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Verse 13. Woe to you, Corazon. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you and you, Capernaum. You will be exalted to heaven. Who, who, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Okay. Now, what's happening here? The symbolic act of wiping dust off your feet from a home or town that didn't receive you was to emphasize how severe their rejection is of the message of Christ. Because to reject you, as Jesus says here, is to reject Jesus, which is to reject God. Now, because, they were, because this was happening, this was showing, when you're dusting off your feet, it was actually showing the response to the, to the hardness of people's heart. And we notice in our verses that Jesus goes in really hard on Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, pronouncing judgment on them. Verse 12, Jesus first says, I tell you that it will be more bearable on the day of Sodom for, than for that town, a town that would reject the message of Christ. Now, for many of us, we've heard of Sodom and Gomorrah, how God wiped them out for their sin. Jesus says that they, that this town, it would be worse for them than for Sodom. Ouch, that hurts. But then Jesus also says in verse 14, it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Now, what made Tyre and Sidon notable was because it was the hometown of Jezebel. Jezebel was the queen of Israel during Elijah's time, and she made Israel the center of idol worship. She made it the center of Baal worship and killed God's priests. She was wicked on top of wicked on top of wicked. And Jesus says that during the day of judgment, it would be better for Tyre and Sidon than for these three towns. Why so harsh on these three towns of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum? Uh, let me just show you on a map here, if Linda can pull this up here. Let me show you on a map here that when you notice that these three towns here, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, this here is the primary area in which Jesus did most of his teaching and work. That these three towns had a front row seat to Jesus. That much of Jesus' earthly ministry, his headquarters was in Capernaum. So these are towns, these are people who heard the gospel of, from Jesus himself. They saw the miracles themselves. They saw the healings themselves. They were done in their towns and they still rejected Jesus and the message of salvation. This is why the judgment of Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum is so severe because their sinful rejection just showed how deep and persistent their pride was. The same is true today. People are rejecting God not because God's teaching is not clear. They're rejecting because they don't like it. They prefer their truth over God's truth. And the lesson here is that God will hold us accountable to this. 
And the more that God makes us aware of these areas of disobedience, and the more that we reject him, the more we stay unrepentant, the greater the judgment. So let me just say, if there is hardness in your heart today towards Jesus, repent today. Accept the gift of forgiveness that Jesus gives so graciously and generously. Please know that he loves you. Now, what it means for us as disciples is that we need to be ready for the harvest to be hard because the harvest is human beings. And human beings are independent, are consumer-driven, are self-sufficient, are opinionated. Human beings are tough. Okay, I know it because I'm one. Okay, I'm tough. Recently, I was talking to somebody about God, and they said to me, hey, are you trying to convert me? Oh, I don't know. And they said, it's not going to work. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Jesus encourages us in these moments, don't take it too personally. Because he says in verse 16, if they reject you, they reject me, Jesus. And if they reject me, Jesus, they're also rejecting God. This is a reminder that when we go into the harvest, we do not go alone that we go with God, that we go with Jesus, and that when we go, don't worry about your name, don't worry about your reputation. There's only one name you need to care about, and that's the name of Christ. And this leads us to our final point here in verses 17 to 20. Jesus wants us to experience joy when we head into the harvest. And this is such an important point because you can hear this topic about the harvest is plentiful, we need to go out there, and it can just feel like guilt and shame, and responsibility, and burden, and work, and duty, okay? And there's a part of this. There is obedience to this, but if guilt is your motivating factor, you're not going to last. But if joy is your motivation, oh, you will endure. You will persevere. Look at verse 17 and 20. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to him, said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Okay, so the 72, they return with joy. First, they're filled with joy because they have seen authority. They've had authority over and power over unclean spirits. You know, they're just so hyped up about that. And then Jesus says, kind of like in a really like kind of nonchalant way, oh yeah, 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 I know Satan. I saw him fall from heaven. What? <laughs> like what's going on here, right? Now first off, let me just say this. When Jesus uses the word Satan, which is now the first time that he uses the name uh, in the gospel of Luke, this Hebrew name means adversary. I think this is to tell us that this is the enemy of the harvest. It is Satan. That God would seek to give life and life to the fullest. That seek, Satan would seek to kill, destroy, and steal. Now, when Jesus says here that I saw Satan fall like a lightning from heaven, man, that's such a big statement, okay? It, it tells us a couple of things about who Satan was and is. So first, Satan was created by God as a beautiful spiritual being. Satan is not God's brother, okay? Satan is not equal to God in any way. Forget about those movies, okay? Ignore all those movies about Satan and God. God is creator. Satan is created. They are not on the same level. And Satan, we know from Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, Satan seemed to have a very important and prominent role serving right next to the throne of God. Some would even say that he was the worship leader of heaven. But what happens is that he falls from heaven because he began to covet. That he saw the throne of God and he wanted a little bit of that throne for himself. He wanted to be worshipped as well. Uh, let me show you what Isaiah 14 says here about that moment when he falls. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. In these few verses, five times we see Satan say, I will. 
This is the very sin of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. This is the heart of pride and unrepentance. I will instead of God's will. So Satan was cast down by God from heaven, taking a third of the angels with him. And Jesus says here that I remember that day. It's an amazing statement. First, Jesus affirms his deity, that I was there from the very beginning. And second, Jesus tells us that Satan is a fallen and defeated foe. And his, and his defeat will be final when Jesus returns for the final time. That there is no tug of war match between Jesus and Satan. There is no close call. There is no buzzer beater moment. Satan is defeated and it's not even close. That is the power of Jesus. God is the Lord of the harvest. This is why the 72 were proclaiming the gospel, and they, no, no, as they were proclaiming the gospel, nothing could stand in their way. No demon can stop them. No unclean spirit could, could disobey them, not because of their authority, but it's because they went out with the authority of Jesus. And it's with this authority Jesus sends us out. Now in verse 19, it also says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Now, what does Jesus mean by this? You know, should we start passing out poisonous snakes and scorpions in church to see who has real faith? You, you know, Linda, if you can, I brought some snakes in the back over there. If you can just start passing it out. and well, Let's see who has real faith in the room here, right? Okay, no, 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 no. Okay, it's, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. The point is, when we go out in the power of Jesus, nothing shall hurt you. Now, we need to be careful here because this does not mean that you're bulletproof, okay? All 12 disciples, except for the Apostle John, was killed for their faith. Paul, we know, was shipwrecked. He was hungry. He was stoned and eventually beheaded for his faith. Following Jesus can hurt. Following Jesus can cost you your life. We see this all across the world. So what does Jesus mean by this when he says, nothing can hurt you? It means nothing can do final harm to you. This is why Jesus says in verse 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus is telling them that as great as it was that you were casting out demons, as great as it was to be serving the Lord, as great as it was to be working the harvest, there is an even greater joy than that. It is the joy of salvation. Your name is written in permanent marker in the Lamb's book of life that we read about in Revelation 13, verse 8. In John chapter 10, verse 28, it says that no one can snatch us out of the Father's hands. So if our name is written in the Lamb's book of life, I'm forever secure. This is such an encouragement. As hard as it might be to follow Jesus, as challenging as it might be to share our faith, we belong to Jesus. Our names are in the book. And when your name is in the book, these things are true of you. You are ransomed from every bondage. You are purchased for God's precious possession. Christ has taken your place under the punishment of divine wrath. God has taken out the heart of stone and put in its place the heart of flesh. He has forgiven you all your sins and declared you innocent before God. You are rescued from the terrors of hell. He will lead you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He will present you blameless before the throne of God. He will give you a new glorious body free of pain and suffering. He will give you access to the very presence of God where there will be fullness of pleasures forevermore. This is your greater joy. This is a joy that is deeper than all other joys. This is such an important reminder that no matter how gifted you are or productive or successful or powerful or fruitful in ministry, Nothing is ever better than being saved. In addition, not every day is going to be great. Now, these 72 come back and they're successful, they're encouraged, but not every day is going to have a happy ending. Sometimes we will get discouraged, and Jesus wants us to know that what is going to carry us is not the success of mission, 
It's not how productive you were for God. It, it, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not about how many people are filling up the pews. It's not about how many people are showing up to this ministry program. It's not about how many people are, are, are clapping for you or patting you on the back or noticing all the things that you're doing. No. Your encouragement comes when you know that you're secure in the Savior's arm. It's knowing that nobody can erase your name from the Lamb's book. We have to keep this in mind because this will give us joy heading into the harvest. That as we preach the gospel to ourselves, we see how Jesus loves us, pursues us, and secures us. How can we not love others the same way? That if Jesus has given us his all, how can we not give our all for the harvest? To know that we are saved securely and eternally means that none of us should be sitting on the sidelines. We have no reason to hesitate. Jesus is the Lord of our lives, and he is the Lord of the harvest. Amen? Amen. So Bethany Baptist, the harvest is plentiful. Are you ready? Let's, let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that God that you would Awaken my heart, awaken our hearts to the harvest. To realize that the spiritual need around us is incredible. That people are ready to hear about God's love. And God, help us to go out. And help us to go out with joy. Knowing that your son Jesus Christ has purchased us, pursued us, loves us. God, I pray, Lord, that for Bethany Baptist here, with such a long history of faithfulness in working the harvest, that God, that you will continue to bear fruit and bring fruit into this church, that the ministries that they're doing with their Bible studies, Lord, with Awana, with all these wonderful things, that God, that you will help them, Lord, to continue to be able to help people connect the spiritual dots, to know just how much Jesus loves them. That God, we pray for all the neighbors across the street and all around this building. They got the day will not only just see a building here, but that they would see the light of Christ and be drawn to that. So God, would you help us, Lord? Help us individually, and God, help us corporately to be ready for the harvest. And it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.